The thumb goes in here. Okay. And then the head, you kind of hold it. Which camera should I turn this to? Yeah, <laughs> whichever one you want. So it's kind of like a movable jaw. Uh, that's kind of it. Hi, Yara. Hi, Liam. Thank you so much for having us in your home today. It's a very hot August day, but you've been so welcoming. Um, so I recognize actually some of the things in your space right now, like some of the toys from your Instagram videos, but I was wondering, what can you tell me about the space we're in today? This is my living room. <laughs> I do everything here. Um, I film stuff here, well, between here and my bedroom, but here there's a bit more space. Uh, these are the props that I usually use in the in the short puppet videos I make. Yeah. It's usually like if I want to have a quick set design, I just pop in the bubble gum machine, maybe the boards, put some foam letters on the ground and... You've used some of these things them. as well in an art installation, haven't you? Yes, it was uh, at Zico House, it was a collective it was a collective exhibition curated by Melissa Ghazala. Okay, um, so I've noticed that you have some puppets for me on the table. Absolutely. How long have you been making puppets and what first got you into it? I haven't been making puppets for that long, actually. I've been making puppets for three years. And um, I think I've always been interested in puppets. I think most of us grow up, like when we're kids, we find these things fascinating because mm -hmm. it's these little objects that they look human, but they're not quite human. And they can get away with saying things that maybe we can't really get away with. Um, I don't know what it is exactly that triggered me to start working on puppets, but I know I've always kind of wanted to get into them. And um, so this is the regular mechanism that I work with, um, which is the thumb goes in here. Okay. And then the head, you kind of hold it. Which camera should I turn this to? Yeah, <laughs> whichever one you want. So it's kind of like a movable jaw. Um, that's kind of it. So how long does it usually take you to make one? Um, well, to make the face takes a day and then to paint it a few more days and then the hair takes a while. The hair is a nightmare. I'm sure there's a better way to be doing this, but uh, I usually just cut out old like threads from different kinds of things and I glue them on one by one and it's very inefficient and they keep falling out. Do you enjoy making them? Yes, I do. I get super frustrated making them, but I definitely enjoy making them. Okay. What was the first one you ever made? This one. When I first started working on puppets, uh, I was working with a lot of clockwork mechanisms. So mm -hmm. I would go to uh, Sulahad, buy some old clocks and watches and take them apart. And then I would kind of um, use the stuff on the inside for the eyes. Okay. I don't know if you can. So this one has broken clocks for eyes? Pretty much. Well, this side. That side is just regular. What made you want to make the eyes into broken clocks and a screwdriver? I don't know. I think it's just that I suck at making the eyes and I really like clocks and the mechanisms. I think they're so interesting, especially the mechanical clocks. So um, it was just the easy thing to do. A lot of the time, I think because my work is kind of DIY, I mm -hmm. kind of go with the easy thing to do instead of the pretty thing to do. Okay. And that's why a lot of the times stuff kind of looks ugly. Um, but I kind of just go with it. Do you enjoy making everything yourself? Yeah, it can definitely get frustrating. Yeah, like I've recently started working with other people like on the last film that I'm working on. So for example, this puppet over there, the clock pu puppet is my design, but I delegated the work to a company called One Hand Puppet. Mm -hmm. um, and you can kind of see the difference in the craftsmanship because yeah. they're quite better at making puppets than I am. Uh, so although usually there's something definitely more enjoyable about making everything myself, I've recently been kind of figuring out that sometimes you have to work with other people and sometimes people are more efficient and faster at doing the job than you are. Has it been challenging for you to work with other people? No, it's been surprisingly, it's been like really a pleasant surprise. Um, just really nice surprises. Everyone kind of has their input and it kind of 
takes the project in a different mm -hmm. direction. I feel if you're a bit of a control freak, that could be a problem because obviously when other people are involved, you don't have that much control over every single detail anymore. Yeah. Uh, but I think because I was kind of malleable with the past few projects, I didn't really mind each person kind of imposing their vision a little bit and doing what they needed to do. Okay. So we're surrounded by a bunch of musical instruments. I've noticed all your home, and uh, this is a good point to mention that aside from working with puppets, you're also a musician. So let's talk a little bit about your music. So you tend to use unconventional objects and unconventional instruments to generate sound. So what drives you to choose these specific instruments in your work? Um, as a kid, there were two instruments that I was uh, really interested in, which were the glass harmonica and the crystal bache. The glass harmonica is basically a series of concentric glass balls through which runs a rod, and the rod is attached to a wheel, and the musician kind of turns the wheel with a pedal, and then they can play it like a piano. And the sound you get is, is kind of, um, the sound comes from the resonance of the glass. And the crystal bache, which also has like a glass component, um, Basically, it's, it consists of a series of glass rods that are covered with glass tubes. Sorry, metal rods that are covered with glass tubes. Yeah. And the, the sound that comes out in this case isn't from the glass itself. The glass just serves as a means to kind of um, transfer the vibration to the metal rods. So the sound comes from the vibration, vibrating metal rods. Uh, and I think growing up, but really being obsessed with these instruments that I could never afford, um, I got really interested in the sounds that metal and glass can create and I think I kind of deviated towards all these metallic objects like toy pianos which I would like take apart and bend and modify and uh, glass objects, music boxes. I think it was really in search of the sound that I that I mm -hmm. eventually got to the bold metallophone um, because it was what gave me that nice droney kind of ambient metallic texture that I had been looking for for so long. Uh, other than this, mainly I played the accordion. Um, the accordion was go what got me back into music after I had taken a long break from music. And I think it's such a wonderful instrument for, you know, ambient textures and drones. It's, I know sometimes the accordion can be considered kind of a goofy instrument, but I feel like... <laughs> can also be quite majestic. That's such a peculiar word to use for the accordion. Yeah, I don't know. Instrument. So are you interested in like the science of sound? Is that what drives you to choose these instruments? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Am I? I don't know. Um, I'm definitely interested in in the results you can get when you modify things, but I don't know if I would call it a science. Okay. I feel like to, for it to be a science, I'd have to know my shit a little more. I shouldn't say the word no, shit, okay. actually. We'll, we'll let it, you we'll can let bleep it, it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what made you chase ambient sound throughout your life? Wow, I don't know. Did you just like, did it resonate with you? Did you like the way it sounded to you? Yeah, I think, I think it's just that I like the way it sounds. Um, I don't know, growing up I played the piano, I had a bit of a classical background and then I kind of like, I needed a break from it at some point. Okay. Okay. How long did you stop playing music for? A few years, I think. I think I stopped at around 14 and then I started again at 18 or 19. That was a lengthy like that. break for you. Uh, what did you do in that time? Like, what, what, what kept you occupied? I thought I was going to be a doctor. <laughs> and Sorry, I'm mom, not. I'm not. <laughs> but um, yeah, I went to pre-med. I did a year of pre-med. And then I thought, I cannot, I cannot do this for 10 more years yeah. of my life. Yeah, it's, it's hectic for you. Yeah. yeah. But now I, I'm still friends with some people who were in you know, with me in pre-med. So I call them for free medical advice. <laughs> so, you know, it didn't go to waste so that, one year. that one year. Definitely. Um, it's interesting what you said about ambient sound. I actually listen to a lot of ambient music and I really love yours because I feel like it... I don't know what the exact word for it is and I hope that our viewers will forgive me for going on this ramble but I feel like it instills these kinds of feelings in you that you really can't express otherwise. 
I, I just really thoroughly enjoy it. I feel like I get that music, I get that from your music as well. Um, what are three feelings that you would hope to invoke in your audience through your work? Through, through like my work in general or music specifically? Music specifically. Yeah. I think in music, um, the feelings I try to look for are familiarity and comfort, but also discomfort. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, and a lot, of a lot of the times what I'm searching for is something that I need to hear before, before I'm thinking about connecting with others or making music for others. I'm doing this because it's how I know how to deal with things and how I know to, um, I know it's, it's quite a cathartic process and for me it was always more about the process than, it, it was never really about putting my music out there and having people hear it. And then when people actually, some people started listening to the music, I was a bit taken aback because it's like, oh, okay, so you, you like this, that's cool, I'm glad. Um, I think it's a different kind of approach once you start thinking that other people are actually listening to the things you do just for fun in your room, in your living room, because this is, I, I usually work from here. Um, I think you approach it a bit differently, but I don't want to go on a rant about that. Actually. No, I no, feel no, like no, please, please tell me more. I would love to hear more about it. I don't know. I think I've been, I've been wondering lately about this idea of making work for others like do you make the work for yourself do you make it to connect with others and once you're making work to connect with others does that automatically change the kind of work you're doing because now once I'm in a place where I'm maybe writing music knowing that someone's going to hear it mm -hmm. it, it feels like a kind of pressure that maybe wasn't there before so for now, for example, my first release uh, is called Home Recordings because that's what they are. They were just a bunch of recordings that I, um, I recorded on my phone, on my tape recorder. And for me, I didn't really think anyone would hear them. Um, sometimes I would play them on my Rajul Hara set because it's like a space for me to improvise. Or sometimes I would you know, throw a few drafts on SoundCloud, but it was, it was never really something that I made for people to hear. And then all of a sudden we were collecting um, these pieces in order to put them out there on a label on Hive Mind Records and it made me think okay I'm the stuff I worked on for myself maybe I should have approached it differently maybe I would have approached it differently if I'd known that other people were going to listen to it and I think that's also that's also something that I'm a bit iffy about now yeah. when I think about this release yeah it's really interesting that you brought up the idea of creating for yourself and creating for people. I feel like a lot of people really struggle with this, like putting something that they think people will like or putting something that you're at peace at. Um, but from what you said, I get the feeling that you never really made music thinking that one day you'd start performing it for people. Yeah, I never thought I would actually start performing. This year was, uh, my first performance was this year, my first two performances and... Uh, How did that go? <laughs> Um, it went well. Well, some performances went better than others. Okay. Um, but there are definitely some some lovely moments here and there. I think it's. I think when I started performing is when I started thinking about this idea of making music for other people or making music just for the sake of making music. Okay. Um, I know that you had your first solo performance at Metro Medina earlier this year. Yeah. It was um, my first endorsed performance. Before that, I had done one at Der al for the Art Design Lebanon closing. Is it called the close? The closing ceremony. The closing yeah, ceremony. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Metro Medina was my first endorsed performance. Yes, it was. Uh, this was one of my favorite performances, actually. Okay, tell me about a memorable experience on stage during that day. The performance was called Everything's One Year in RGB and basically I was scoring a bunch of uh, things from TV that we used to see when we were younger uh, as a Lebanese audience, I think. And um, I was scoring things like Zen on a Hood, um, Mini Studio, and then at, <laughs> at one point uh, Chef Antoine comes up <laughs> and I remember at the time I was really really fidgety kind of the way I am now a little bit but maybe worse because <laughs> there was this void of an audience in front of me and it was lit in a way where I couldn't really see the audience yeah. 
And so I was quite nervous and I was shaky. And then Chef Antoine comes up on the screen and people start laughing. <laughs> and then I also start laughing. And then Childhood icon, <laughs> Chef Antoine. <laughs> so basically, I'm laughing and the audience is laughing and I'm just laughing through the piece. And my anxiety was kind of, it just disappeared at that point. And it just felt nice to kind of, it just felt like we were all kind of just enjoying this moment together. Okay. Would you perform again? Yeah, I mean, I've been taking a bit of a break from uh, performing just because I get, I'm such a nervous wreck anytime I perform before, <laughs> after, during. Um, okay, I feel like it's something that you're going to get better at the more you do. I hope so. This is me suddenly pushing you into perform. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's get back to your general art. Uh, what are three topics that you would love to explore in your art? Mm, so in my puppet videos, for example, a concept I explore a lot is the concept of time and that of time loops. The little characters stuck in these little universes of their creation, kind of like a sort of limbo or a sort of personal hell. Uh, and they're all stuck in this kind of time loop. Uh, another topic I would say would be fear or anxiety, like a lot of them uh, tackle fears of mine that I feel are universal. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is that I kind of try to box in these little anxieties and these fears and make it make them into something kind of ridiculous, something that you can, you know, point your finger at and laugh at and then stack away somewhere and never look at again. Do you feel like doing that, like boxing these anxieties up makes it easier for you to deal with these things in real life? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I think it's my way of approaching these things. You mentioned that your characters are stuck in these universes, in these time loops. Do you feel like you're plagued by time? Do you feel like time is something that you struggle to deal with? Like having not enough time, too much time? I don't know. I feel like time is, this, is a universal problem. Like It's just a problem in general for everyone. Um, I do have some fears, though, that I do fear the concept of eternity for me. It's just terrifying. I don't even want to think. You'd about rather it ended at some point. I'd rather it ends at some point. Like, um, you know, you live, you have these few mediocre years, and you die, and um, <laughs> you know, and it's great. I think that's great because it ends. It's great, but if it doesn't end, then it's a bit, a bit of yeah. a prison, kind of. Yeah, which is terrifying. That's, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. So, can you tell me about one person that you've met throughout your journey that has always inspired you? Yes, actually my uh, old poetry professor, Dr. Michael Dennison, he taught me when I was uh, at university, he taught me a poetry course, and I've watched him recite his poetry in different places. Um, and throughout the years, strangely enough, we became friends, and he would share his work and I would share my work, and it became kind of a friendship based on our work where I would constantly want to read what he's been writing and he'd listen to what I was uh, writing. And um, actually recently in the last film that we were working on, he was the main character. He's Mr. Samuel. <laughs> What's the movie called? It's called Mr. Samuel's Home for Good Children and Confused Adults. Okay. So let's actually talk about the film. What can you tell me about it? What can we expect from it? So uh, a lot of emphasis was put on the set building. The set was built by uh, Ayatwi and Wert Sleiman. And uh, it's basically the universe is set in a kid's TV show, but it's disintegrating. So it's happening inside Mr. Samuel's living room. And as he tries to teach kids about concepts like home and time and death, um, there is actually a, a void that's expanding in the ground and the set is kind of crumbling apart as it goes on and that's kind of the idea of the of the short film okay that's really interesting actually i would have never thought that a tv show like a tv show could disintegrate i think i think i've had nightmares about that as a child but it would be really nice to see it as an adult um so my final question to you is we've met multiple times we've had conversations before and so now that we have this like friendship between us, what film would you recommend to me? Oof. Um, okay. So I would recommend Shuji Terayama's To Die in the Country. And why would you recommend it? I just think it's so beautiful. He's, he's my favorite director and it's such a beautiful film. I think you'd enjoy it. 
Okay. Also. Thank you so much, Yara. This Thank was you, a Nian. very lovely conversation. I did my best. I hope you can all keep that in mind. <laughs> Thank you for showing us a little part of your world and a little bit of your space. This was really lovely.